my friend, Lucasfilm Story Group's Pablo Hidalgo. Hey, Andy. Hi, Pablo. You've been with the company for a long time now. It'll be 17 years in February. Star Wars became my day job by 2000. And how did you come to land at Lucasfilm? Uh, I freelanced for West End Games. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of opened up a lot of professional doors. I would go down to Gen Con, which is the big uh, sort of tabletop uh, role-playing game game convention, mm -hmm. which is also a professional convention because that's when all the editors and publishers go, and that gives you s an opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with these folks. So I had already been freelancing for a few years, and I'm like, I want to meet these folks. And I brought my own Star Wars encyclopedia that I did. <laughs> as like a resource for myself mm -hmm. and I wanted to show them like, hey guys, look what I did. At the 96 Gen Con convention, Steve Sansweet was there. And uh, Steve was doing Lucasfilm's marketing outreach to core fans about the special edition trilogy which was coming out the following year. And so I got a chance to meet Steve and I had heard through the grapevine that he was writing the Star Wars Encyclopedia for Delray Books. And I said, you know, Steve, I Kind of, I've got Just my so own encyclopedia. To... Yeah, it's like if you need help, if you need a hand, and he took me up on the offer. So he sent me the manuscript, and I and I offered notes on it, and so I kind of established this relationship with Steve. So he knew me not only as a writer but as a Star Wars fan. A few short years later, in the fall of '99, there was a job posting uh, on Lucasfilm.com for an internet content developer, mm -hmm. which was essentially a writer for Star Wars.com, and I just took a shot and applied for it, and I just kept getting callbacks and callbacks and by January I was flying down to Skywalker Ranch for an interview. I'd asked Steve whether or not I could use him as a reference and he said no. I'm like, oh, well why not? And it's like, because uh, I'm going to be interviewing you. Uh, <laughs> so it's, you so know, that worked out pretty well. It worked well. out pretty well, yeah. Wink, you, wink. You came on kind of in the infancy of StarWars.com, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good job. Yeah. Um, Tell me about how you kind of progressed through the company to where you are now in the story group. Up at Skywalker Ranch where I started, I was hired to do writing for StarWars.com. And the great thing about that is that required you to interface with the entire company. Because we wanted to profile Lucasfilm, we wanted to profile the state of Star Wars. So that I would have to go interview someone at Skywalker Sound. Mm -hmm. Or go talk to someone in licensing, or talk to someone in publishing, or talk to someone in whatever capacity. And so that got me out there, and people quickly came to realize, well, this guy knows his Star Wars. And that just became part of making Star Wars stuff. It's like, make sure Pablo has seen it before it goes out the door so that we don't make some sort of misstep, or you just have that kind of, not only have a fan perspective, because I'm a fan, but just like, you know, I'll be the guy who will nitpick and say, you know, you flipped R2-D2, you should, that, that, image is backwards. He's got his projector on the wrong side, which happens more often than you'd think. Right. Or used to happen more often than you'd think. We have very strict rules about stuff like that. Never flip images. Never. Yeah, flip. yeah. Back then it was a little bit loosey-goosey, and now it's like, well, because I remember the stuff that would jump out to me as a fan before I ever started working here, thinking, like, didn't anyone see this? I decided to uh, kind of formalize the role and say, isn't there a capacity where I could look at everything that comes out? And then that was right around the time that, you know, Lucasfilm basically got reinvigorated with Kathleen Kennedy coming aboard and the, having this whole plan for more feature films. And she instituted the story group, you know, with Kiri Hart in charge of it. There was a core group and, and Kiri decided that they needed someone like me and someone like Leland and eventually someone like Matt. Wink, wink. There's a lack of information, I think, about what it is the story group does. A lot of people have misconceptions about the amount of power you have or the decisions you make. Can you kind of give the Cliff's Notes version of, of your role? Yeah, I think the easiest thing that people will latch their heads around is like, oh, you must, you're like a continuity cop. And it's like, well, that's not really it, right? It's, it's more about like, if you were to try to boil it down is, is we work with any creative who is wanting to tell a story at Star Wars. And we help them find the story that they want to tell but also make sure that story fits within the framework of Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about making sure the number of moons over a planet is correct. It's more about, you know, what thematically, what are you going for? And what's the best way to, to achieve that with Star Wars? And also, is the story that you're telling, is it something we've done before? Or is it something that's also actually in development somewhere else in the company? So we become this sort of, uh, this, this point that um, coordinates all storytelling across the board so that we don't, you know, inadvertently tell something that's contradictory, not only from a continuity point of view, but from a thematic point of view. Never. 
I'll never turn to the dark side. How many times a day do you get asked if something is canon? <sighs> A lot. <laughs> I know. A lot. I could tell there. You know, I could, there's. I could tell when a user is asking me questions, not because they're genuinely interested. There's part of that, but because they're they've got a wiki page open on their other window, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Hey, this isn't defined. Let me ask this person." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, and I, like I'll get twelve questions in a row. I'm like, well, wait a minute, you're just you're just doing homework. I'm doing your homework for you. I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, engage me. Talk to me. Why do you want to know this? Is it interesting? Kind of thing. So. Um, I get asked a lot about the Freemaker adventures, mm -hmm. whether or not they're canon. Right. And it's like, ah, you know, that's not my place to say. Mm -hmm. It's because it's not the, it's like literally the least important aspect of the show. <laughs> it's like, is it fun? Is it awesome? Is it adventurous? And people get caught up intensely in what's canon and what's not. And I think the way you put it once on Twitter was the best way I've ever seen it was, what is it? It doesn't matter to the viewer as much if it's canon, but it matters to the storytellers. To some degree, yeah, to some degree, but the only extent to which it matters is does another storyteller need to be beholden to it? And that's really like the, the functional definition of canon. Because what tends to happen is in, on you know, internet discussion is it becomes a definition of quality. Mm -hmm. And that's not our functional definition of it, right? I claim this sword, and my rightful place is leader! Never! No outsider will ever rule Mandalore! My lady, is that any way to treat your rightful ruler? got out of Maul. I hope it was worth it. Do not go back in there. They'll possess you again. Wh what about you? Take it. It's yours. Ignite the blade. There's no one I trust to wield the Darksaber more than you. Now I understand why the Saber came to me. It came to me so I could pass it to you. I accept this sword for my sister. For my clan. And for all of Mandalore. Why don't you kill him now and take it? It's yours now. What is? The dark saber. It belongs to you. No, it belongs to her. She can't take it. In order for her to wield the dark saber again, she would need to defeat you in combat. I yield. It's yours. Oh, no. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Without that blade. She's a pretender to the throne. He's right. It never even enters into their mind if they need to understand it in this sort of weird, abstract, academic way. Wink, wink. wink. The Leia novel, Princess of Alderaan, has, has Leia actually going there. That's another one that people absolutely need to read, because then you get to meet Admiral Holdo, mm -hmm. and she's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> she's such a cool, cool character. Mm -hmm. My favorite moment in the entire movie, and Quite possibly one of my new favorite moments in Star Wars is that moment of silence. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hold yeah. Hold the hero. Holdo, yeah. yeah. Can is there any specific inspiration that went into that, or what was the process of, of creating that moment? Because it's all I astounding. know is Ryan. He had it in his story pretty early on. Uh huh. Only we because called he, it the Holdo the hero. Sequence. Yeah. He was asking about the dynamics and the physics and the you know Star Wars physics of could a ship do this? What does it mean? Uh, does this upset anything? And we're like, well. The fact that uh, the Resistance Cruiser and the Mega Destroyer are, are so close in size, I mean, obviously one's still much bigger, is that kind of what allows you to have this 
Titanic explosion that happens. Like, if you flew an X-Wing into a ship at high speed, you're not going to get that. You're only going to get that if something as big as Holdo's ship does what it does. Okay, it's flying towards Earth here at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light. Zoom out a little bit. Heading just above Florida. Whoa, look at it just vaporizing everything. Just took out all of the United States. Just obliterated this side of the Earth. So you can see the fireball moving across the atmosphere around the Earth. So this just vaporized all of North America and moving into South America. The inverse of what we did with Luke in episode 7 where he was missing but you had this sense of his absence. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, The Last Jedi there is this sense of Han's absence throughout the film which is really beautiful. Does uh, choose poor Gavin name? No, but that sounds like something you could get Star Wars show to hashtag. Yeah. Uh, I feel like Chewie would have named it and we wouldn't be able to pronounce it. Oh, see, I, 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 think, it, I think it looks like a oh. Kevin. <laughs> Yeah. I love that scene. That's why he was shirtless yeah. the next time. <laughs> you never know. It's like, 99! Working on his guns, 100. waiting for this. Oh. Didn't see you there. <laughs> oh, hey. He actually <laughs> spent, a, spent a lot of time just walking around shirtless, hoping for that connection yeah, to kick right. in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so good. And now you have the first of the Star Wars show mugs. Those aren't, those aren't even official really? yet. That's not even a thing. That's a prototype. It could be bigger. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming by, Pablo. It's always super fun to talk to you. Yeah, nice to um, meet you. And, and yes, none of this is canon. <laughs> no. None of it. No, no, no. Have you ever removed your helmet? No. Has it ever been removed by others? Never. I've been searching for more of our kind. I've been quested to deliver this child. I was hoping that... This is the way. Wink, wink. Candle bite was just a lot of fun. Please like, subscribe, and comment on the video. May the force be with you. Impressive. The most impressive.